When we think of the war in the Pacific, images of stubbornly defended tropical islands may pop into our heads. Of US Marines battling across blue lagoons and up palm fringe beaches. Names like Guam, Tinian and Peleliu. But if I was to say that US and Japanese soldiers also slogged it out in a frozen landscape of snow-capped mountains and sub-Arctic tundra, you may be surprised. For there was a war in the North Pacific that resembled the worst conditions of the infamous Eastern Front, where frostbite was as deadly an enemy as the Japanese. I'm talking about the Aleutian Islands campaign off the coast of Alaska, an unlikely battleground between Japan and the United States, but the location for some very tough winter fighting. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service created by the founder of the Discovery Channel that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Like Adolf Hitler, The Itinerary, an immense study of Hitler's movements from childhood to the end of his life, and D-Day Hidden Traces that uses archaeology to uncover what was left behind in Normandy by Allied and Axis troops from helmets to bunkers. If you sign up between November the 16th and January the 3rd, you can get 25% off a yearly subscription. That's unlimited access for only $14.99 a year. So use the code MarkFelton when you sign up and get 25% off your yearly subscription. Curiosity Stream, the best streaming service for lovers of history. The Aleutians are a chain of 14 big and 55 small islands, stretching in an arc 1,200 miles west from the Alaskan Peninsula towards Russia. In World War II, they were mostly inhabited by Native Americans, with few settlements. Due to their position, the Aleutians, which are sub-Arctic, were strategically important, and in 1941, the US had a few air bases and small army garrisons to protect them. The islands control Pacific transportation routes, and the Japanese believe that by occupying some of them, they could guard against a US attack across the North Pacific against the Japanese home islands. To this end, in June 1942, Japanese air and naval forces launched assaults, timed with the attack on Midway, that resulted in their occupation of the islands of Kiska and Attu. This was an important propaganda victory for the Japanese, comparable to the German occupation of the British Channel Islands in 1940, because Kiska and Attu were sovereign US territory and US soil. It was the first invasion of America since Pancho Villa's incursions across the U.S. southern border into New Mexico in 1916. The U.S. feared that the Japanese would use the islands as springboards for more attacks on the U.S. west coast. And from August 1942, U.S. aircraft based at Adak Island began a bombing campaign against the Japanese occupiers. U.S. submarines were also active in sinking Japanese supply ships. This culminated in the naval battle of the Komandorsky Islands, resulting in two Japanese cruisers being damaged, as well as one American cruiser and two destroyers. After this, Japan could only supply her forces on Kiska and Attu by submarine. Operation Land Crab was conceived by the Americans to eject the Japanese from Attu. Though the campaign was conducted in mid to late May 1943, conditions ashore were terrible. It was freezing cold, with snow blanketing the mountainous interior of the island, and fog and rain made visibility difficult and aerial operations patchy. Some 2,500 Japanese troops defended Attu under the command of Colonel Yasuyo Yamasaki. The southern landing site was the ominously named Massacre Bay. 11,000 US troops would land on Attu. Colonel Yamasaki realized that his small force could not prevent the Americans from landing, so he pulled back most of his forces into the rugged mountains where weather and terrain would favor the defenders. After having lived on Attu for over a year, the Japanese were acclimatized to the conditions, but the Americans would be shocked by the freezing conditions, the snow, rain, mud, and the often powerful winds. 
supplying the troops once ashore became a nightmare due to the often stormy sea conditions and fogs. On the 11th of May 1943, US troops landed at Holtz Bay on the northern coast and the aforementioned Massacre Bay in the south. Beneath the barrage of a battleship's guns, United States forces move in to drive the Japanese from rocky, fog-bound Attu, strategic island in the Aleutian chain. Troops waiting for the zero hour. Time to go over the side. Invasion boats, filled with men and guns, determined to wrest the island from the enemy. For Attu lies but 750 miles from the great Japanese naval base at Paramushiri. There was no resistance from the Japanese on the beaches. Logistical difficulties quickly asserted themselves as vehicles found they couldn't cope with the terrain and the foul weather and poor maps slowed down resupply operations. As the US forces advanced into the mountainous interior, Japanese resistance was fierce, fighting from bunkers and trenches. US troops often went hand to hand with the Japanese, inching their way upwards through the snow suffering many more casualties from frostbite and trench foot as those who were wounded in action. Now, American Army cameramen record the final advance up the snow-covered mountainside. In single file, spread out for miles, the United States lines move ahead. artillery hurling shells across the mountain peaks. By the 29th of May, it appeared that the Japanese were nearly finished, but Colonel Yamasaki had one more card left to play, something the Americans had not foreseen. With his remaining men trapped on a hill, and running out of ammunition and food, Yamasaki decided to launch a counterattack, hoping to break through the American lines, take out the US artillery that was causing many problems, and eventually turn the battle until reinforcements could arrive from Japan to support him. The Japanese military had a tradition of suicide instead of surrender. And just before dawn on the 29th of May 1943, Yamasaki launched a Banzai charge directly through the US lines. Such was the ferocity of the Japanese assault that they managed to penetrate the US frontline positions, though they took heavy casualties in the process. They were only stopped by surprised rear echelon personnel who grabbed weapons and fought like lions. Yamasaki and most of his men were killed. Thereafter, only scattered Japanese resistance remained and it was cleared up over a space of a few days. In total, the Battle of Attu cost the Japanese 2,351 killed. Only 28 Japanese survived to be taken prisoner, most of them already wounded. Many others were missing, never to be found. US casualties amounted to 549 killed and 1,148 wounded. A further 1,814 men became sick or died from disease. The next objective was to recapture the island of Kiska. Not relishing a replay of the Attu campaign, the US subjected Kiska to three weeks of intense bombardment.
U.S. and Canadian forces were concentrated on nearby Amchitka Island, preparatory to the invasion. United States troops close in on the cold, barren island of Amchitka in the Aleutians, a new base for the bombing of the Jap-held island of Kiska, 40 airline miles away. The Japs had completed reconnaissance of Amchitka, but this American convoy got there first. They seized the initiative in the struggle for this important chain of islands that stretches 600 miles west of Alaska like a curved sword pointed at the Japanese mainland. These official army pictures, made during the winter, have just been released. Brigadier General Jones commands the operation. The shoreline hums with activity as Army engineers prepare runways for fighter and bombing planes. The Japs on Kiska Island are being heavily pounded almost every day. Operation Cottage would see the U.S. 7th Infantry Division, the 87th Mountain Infantry Regiment, and the Canadian 13th Infantry Brigade land on the 15th of August 1943, plus a unique American-Canadian Commando Unit, the 1st Special Service Force. Canadians join American forces in the campaign to drive the Japanese out of Kiska, last enemy base in the Western Hemisphere. Canadian and American generals with Admiral Kincaid, Allied commander, supervise the embarkation somewhere in the Aleutians. In the gray Arctic light, the combined Allied fleet steams for its objective. Troops don war paint, camouflage, for what they expected to be the bloodiest of battles against a foe fighting to the death. The landings were made successfully, but the Allies didn't realize until later that the Japanese had actually evacuated their garrison from Kiska some time before the landings. However, this didn't prevent the US and Canadian forces from accidentally fighting each other, as each side mistook the other for Japanese troops as they advanced. In one appalling friendly fire incident, a full-scale battle developed between U.S. and Canadian soldiers in the rugged mountain terrain, resulting in 28 Americans and 4 Canadians killed and about 100 wounded. Japanese mines, booby traps, accidents and weather casualties eventually resulted in almost 100 fatalities and 221 wounded, not one Japanese soldier being present on Kiska at the time. So ended the Japanese occupation of U.S. territory, and the only land campaign on American soil of World War II. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share. Please also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.